In the meantime, I just want to say thanks to everyone for joining. Uh, very much appreciate it. Happy to share some of what I learned so far and, and hear some of your questions and uh, talk some things out along the way. All right, confirmation. We can definitely see your screen. Great. All right, so I am Matt Bilotti. I am currently, uh, do a little bit about me, uh, I'm currently a product manager at a company called Drift. We're based in Boston. Previously, I did some product work at Hot, a company called Attend.com and another company called Chattermob. And in total, I've probably helped seen and, and helped launch around six or seven different products. So a bunch of learnings, a bunch of different times doing this. And we've launched a couple different products at Drift specifically. Um, in the past year or so, I'm going to talk about some of the things that I learned there as well, as well as some of the stuff that I learned in the past. A little bit about Drift. Drift's mission is to help everyone on Earth know, grow, and amaze their customers. We uh, have created a tool for you to put live chat on your product or uh, in your product or on your website so you can send targeted messages and engage leads to convert them to customers, that kind of thing. So uh, a little bit about some of the recent launches that we've had. Um, Back in October, we released Drift for product marketers. This is a screenshot from Product Hunt, and that was kind of the first big unveiling of, of Drift as it was. And uh, we learned a bunch of things from that. Uh, product is very different from what it was back then, but that was one launch. In January, we created this other product called the Drift Daily, which was basically uh, a tool that would plug into existing services that you use, like MailChimp or HubSpot, and it would gather all the uh, new contacts in those systems and enrich them with data, send you an email every day of all of the new leads that you have that are visiting your website. So we launched that one in January, got some pretty good success with that. And we also uh, launched a two-way integration with Slack so you could have conversations with people on your website right from Slack. So those are a couple of the couple of launches. And what I want to talk through are, are a couple key pieces around launching a product and, and the way that we think about it here at Drift and some, some lessons I've learned based on stories uh, and, and a couple takeaways as well. So hopefully you walk away uh, from this with at least a couple frameworks or, or some pieces of advice for when you're launching your own product. So at Drift, we're very, very customer for first, customer focused, and so I wanted to start off by uh, addressing the customer feedback loop and how we get, uh, manage, and uh, define that uh, customer feedback and into building actual products for. So, a couple of the ways that we look at it this Drift is we are actively always encouraging feedback uh, by nature of our tool. We have live chat on our site and in our product at all times. So people are constantly writing in, constantly saying, hey, how do I do this? Or hey, can I do this? Or uh, hey, have you thought about this? And so we're always getting tons and tons of feedback. And, and I'd highly recommend that uh, you have some, some way for just open activity to happen for your customers to, to reach out to you. We're also, uh, you know, as soon as we start realizing that there might be an opportunity for a new piece of the product or a new product in, in general, we start actively reaching out to people uh, and, and just getting their feedback and setting up times to have full conversations. So it's very, very conversation focused. Uh, the other piece of it is that every single mention of a problem or a suggestion of a solution to something that the customer or a potential customer is kind of running into, we document all of that. I take screenshots of everything. Uh, I copy and paste things, share them in team rooms, but most importantly, kind of put them in specific places and in different tools to make sure that those are always there. And I'll, I'll touch back on the importance of that uh, in the future. And one of the one of the main reasons that we're doing that is because the way that we see it is that uh, me as the product manager, it's not necessarily my role to define the, the solution. It's more of defining the problem and gathering all the information possible about what customers are saying, uh, what other people in the market are doing, uh, and what potential solutions might be, but I'm not the one who's saying, here's what we need to do. It's more of, here's what's going on, and here's all of the data associated with that problem based on exact words that our customers or potential customers are using. So that's why it's so important to have all that stuff logged, because it's a treasure trove of data, uh, as well as, you know, once you release the, the feature or, or the new product, you have all of those quotes and all of those things that you can then take and then personally follow up with all of these people uh, depending on what they said, so you can make it very personalized, like, hey, I know that you said that you have this problem, we have now built this solution for you. And then you can keep getting feedback on that and continue to iterate. Um, 
Yeah, and, and the designers, so once I pass that off to design and engineering, they work with the customers, so they, they see all the feedback, they take a pass at what a potential solution is, and then we loop customers back into the equation. We create an envision file, we share it with them, we say, hey, what do you think? Does this solve what you were looking for? Is this helpful? And we keep going through that cycle until we have something where the majority of those people that gave feedback in the first place raise their hand and say, yes, this is the one, this is the one that we want. So the other really important thing uh, that we get from reaching out and getting that feedback, whether it's us being proactive or being reactive of getting it, is that it gives us all that data and the most important piece is to focus on the job to be done. One of the things about launching a product, and I've seen this too many times, I've, I've been there, I've done it, uh, is that it's really easy to just get on this runaway train of, oh, like we were solving this one initial problem and then four other problems got bucketed in and then we're solving all these things and then our product is huge and we have this huge vision and that's amazing, but it's really important to stay focused on that one specific thing at the beginning. So uh, walk through a quick story. Uh, back in, in my earlier days as a, as a product manager, we sat down one day and we knew what we wanted to build. We wanted to build something for companies to get quick access to market research information. So we, we came up with a solution, we knew what it was, we worked on it for months and months, it might have even been more than three months there, uh, and we released it and nobody used it. And I think that was very much because we didn't, the whole time that we were building it, we were building on these assumptions and, and all of these additional problems that we assumed were there, but we didn't do a good job defining what that actual job was that we were solving uh, in terms of what the customer is hiring our product to do. So the job there was get me quick access to market research uh, and we got totally sidetracked and we spent all this time and money whereas if we had just focused on that one one thing uh, and the job was quick access to market research then we would have had probably a much better time uh, later on and, and uh, there are whole things that cascade from that but it's really powerful to have that. So at a very high level we got tied up in all the things that it could be that we totally forgot about what it should be and what it should have been was a one, like a very very simple one thing that solved that need to access quick market research. Another thing that I touched on a little earlier was the challenge of keeping scope defined. So anyone who is a product or in product or around product has seen you know you start in one place and you say, all right, the product's going to do this, and then somehow it becomes this plus this, and then it's this plus this plus that, and then it's this huge thing, and the deadlines are getting pushed back, and the thing is four months late, uh, and it's it's hard. Uh, this stuff happens, and it happens totally unintentionally. I don't think anyone intends to, you know, have feature uh, bloat and, and uh, scope creep, as sometimes it's referred to. So. I want to walk through an example of when we launched the Drift Daily. We, you know, the, the job that we were trying to solve was uh, our customers were saying, how do I know who my leads are? I want to know who they are. I want to have quick access into who they are so I could follow up. I want to know what companies they work for, that sort of thing. So we, we crafted out this whole solution that we would send a daily email, we would post the data into Slack, we would have a web app where someone can log in and they can, uh, sort through all of those different contacts and, and see the data there. So what what happened was we had all, we just wanted to build the web app and the email and, and the Slack thing and it just kept getting bigger and bigger because then the web app needs settings and the Slack integration needs this specific formatting and the emails need these formatting and then it has to work in Outlook and then all these things happen and what we kind of came down to was we wanted it to be a short term project to, to see if you know we were onto something and just wanted to get out the door. So we got the email ready and then we just pulled an audible and said, get it out there. You know, we, we solved the job. The job was access to who my leads are. And we solved it with the email and we got it out there and, and, and just pushed it out. And I think that's one of the really important things is uh, knowing when to just say this thing is ready, which I'll, I'll touch on a, a little bit after. Um, so uh, a couple of things here, we, we let the web get totally tangled. Uh, we had, you know, the engineers who were working on the web app needed information from the back-end guys to uh, enrich the data and then the settings to support it. And, and there were all these, just this crazy web. And, and this happens when you have scope creep because you add settings and this happens and you add uh, the ability to do this thing and then it, it loops in the engineer who knows how to do that. And then we need a designer on it. And 
this web just keeps getting tangled and tangled. And the most important thing, and it's a, it's a challenge, I, I face it every day, is you know, how do we identify where there's too much webbing and say, you know, these things are all interconnected here, but we're, we really need it's just to connect this with this and cut out all this other stuff just to get it ready to solve that job. Um, so that's kind of how we think about it. Again, I'll touch a little bit more on that in a bit. And, and yeah, we forgot the initial job that we were solving, and it, it's just easy to say yes to things. You know, this sounds great. The designer suggests this. That's awesome. I'm the product manager. I have this great idea. We should add that, too. The engineers have this sense of this, and, and it's, it's hard to say no, uh, but sometimes you just kind of have to. And, and the best way to say no is to lean on that initial job that you have to find, that, that initial story saying, you know, is this story directly related to solving this? If so, then let's consider it, and if not, We'll think about it in the next iteration. So the big question is, when is my product ready to launch? And uh, we've kind of sculpted a little bit of a product launch framework around this. And there are three major questions that I ask myself every day. Uh, and we ask ourselves, the designers have gotten in the habit of asking this. The engineers have gotten in the habit of asking this. Uh, and, and these are just the questions that say whether or not we're ready to go. Uh, is it ready? The first question is, would the product solve somebody's pain in its current state? If yes, go on to the next question. If no, keep working on it. It's not ready. It's not going to be useful if it doesn't solve someone's pain. Question two is, are there any remaining dependencies? So this could be, uh, you know, there's a new report that you're releasing, but the data for the report isn't ready, or, uh, or there's just there's something disconnected in the way that the software is being built. And then we say, you know, how can we remove them? If they're there, how can we remove them? So it's always thinking back to that web that has been created with, uh, you know, this team depends on this team and depends on this engineer. How can we cut out things there just to get things ready to go? And then three is, uh, does the product actually work? Uh, you know, does it live up to a quality of standard? Does it, is it going to break right away? And if the answer to all these things is positive, so question one, yes, it solves the pain. Question two, no, there's no dependencies. And question three, will it work? Then it's ready to go. Uh, and, and sometimes it's a little painful to not put it out there when it doesn't look like the most beautiful thing in the world. But this comes back to, and I'm sure some of you have heard, the you know, minimal viable product concept. And it's really important. Uh, and, and I know people harp on it all the time, so I won't, I won't go on it too much. But it's, it's important to just get it out the door and define ready being it solves the problem. And uh, you know, maybe it doesn't have all the bells and whistles, but that's totally fine because you make sure that you're solving that job. So a little bit about uh, the way that we go about product development. So we've started to build our own process. We don't, we don't follow Agile. We don't follow uh, any direct framework that's out there. Uh, we follow what we've deemed as responsive development. So I could talk through a couple of the tools that we use and, and some of the values and the first principles that come along with this thing that we're calling responsive development. So these are the first principles that we have crafted around our product development process. So it's adaptive. Uh, we were favoring progress, not necessarily rules, but heuristics that uh, lend themselves to saying this is how we should make decisions. Uh, we're very customer driven. The customer always comes first. We want to be talking directly to the customer. We're iterative, so it's not create this big, big product that's, you know, or a big piece of a product that it's going to do all these amazing things. It's just take it in, take it in pieces, get it out the door. Uh, rapid, moving fast is so important. We're very incremental, uh, which is similar to iterative. Um, learning is never done, so we're always evolving. The framework itself is always evolving. We're data driven, so we don't just make decisions based on what we think internally, which is usually how scope creep happens. There are all these internal conversations happen, and then the scope just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, we're very focused, so again, very focused on the job to be done. So the, the tools that we use, we use Trello uh, to basically manage you know, what is being worked on, both what is being designed today and what is, uh, what is engineering working on today. So this is just a quick glimpse. Uh, this, each list is its own individual release, so we have things uh, built to be very very specific, very focused. The high-level card uh, is around that job to be done. So when I'm creating 
you know, what is up next? I'm defining the problem in a new list on Trello with, uh, with some of that information, which is hosted in ProdPad, and then I bring it over to Trello, um, but it's here, and then this gets passed off to design and engineering, and then they work with it to create the solution. And what I love about ProdPad is that Trello kind of breaks at a point, like it's, you can't just have lists and lists and backlogs and backlogs forever. Uh, and what I love about uh, ProdPad is that I can take all that customer feedback. So way back at the beginning, I talked about writing down all the, the notes and copying and pasting things that customers are saying and taking screenshots. And I dump all of those into ProdPad. I associate them with the customer. And then I associate those pieces of feedback with an idea. So this is where our longer terms idea, ideas go to develop before they're you know, I haven't really defined a problem. I just know that there's something there based on what people are saying. Uh, and then once we get to a point where there's enough data here, there's enough feedback, we then move it over to Trello, and then design and engineering starts to work on it. Uh, I want to touch real quick on avoiding forgotten pieces. Uh, it's really easy to get something out the door, especially if you're moving fast and you're iterative. Uh, I, I know, you know, one of the reasons that scope creep happens, and I, I don't know if it's necessarily why it happens, but it's a byproduct. Um, is that you know you you keep saying oh we have to think about this and oh this and and this and this and what you should really be asking is you know what do we need to make this thing work rather than what do we need to make this thing better and so the first question is what do we need to make this thing work that's stuff like missing an empty state or you know you implement it and the button just doesn't make sense or the way that the flow works it just it's wrong, and it seemed great in the screenshots. And we we struggle with this. Uh, I think it's a hard thing. We we try to work very visually. So going back to the Trello board, like everything is in screenshots, everything's in images. So we try to be really visual. Uh, but we mock it up in the vision files. We share it around internally. We share it with customers. And we also uh, this is something that I want to start implementing soon is a checklist. So each time that we realize that we've launched something and we missed something, there was an aspect to it, a detail that we forgot. Maybe it was an empty state. Maybe it was that sort of thing. We're going to just start creating a, a, an ongoing checklist. So check for empty state. So every time that we're releasing something new, releasing a new product, we can go through this checklist and say, did we consider this thing? Because that's how the other thing caused problems. And do we consider this and this and this? And again, those aren't, how do we make this better, but how do we make sure it works? So just a quick recap of some of the takeaways from, from my presentation here. Uh, document as much uh, of the customer feedback as possible. Uh, put it in put it in tools like ProdPad, put it in, in whatever tool you might use, uh, and make sure it's there and make sure that uh, you know you are helping design and engineering own the solution and, and you as a product person much more so own the own the problem, own defining that problem based on what the customers need. Uh, the other piece is start with the job to be done and focus on it, lean on it to make decisions, lean on it to say yes, lean on it to say no. Uh, use that job again, as, as a means to, to choose things, what to do, what not to do. Uh, look for ways to remove those dependencies. Ask yourself every day, I, I come in every morning and I say, what's in flight? Okay, we're trying to launch this update to reports, we're trying to launch these settings and this other thing. Who's waiting on what? And then I create that mental checklist in my head and I say, okay, what can we remove here to get this thing out today? You know, what can we do taking out different dependencies across teams? So it's, you know, how do we get this designer what they need to finish it now? Or what do they, what does this engineer really need to just get it out the door? Do they need that other piece? Maybe not. Uh, and in which case you can get it, get it launched. Um, use the, the three question product launch framework to make sure that you know when you're ready and consider using the responsive de development framework that I outlined briefly with the tools. Uh, I'm writing a kind of a mini ebook on it, so that'll be out sometime soon, but that is about it for my rambling, and I think we'll, we'll I'll pass it back over to Jana, and we'll, we'll take some questions. Hey, Jana, I, I think you're muted. I can't hear you just yet. Ah, there yes, go. okay, <laughs> I was muted. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Right. Um, I was saying, uh, thanks so much. Um, really enlightening stuff that you uh, you shared with us there. Really appreciate that. Um, so yeah, we definitely do have some questions. Um, I'm happy to fire a couple off. And if you guys have more questions, then by all means, uh, shoot them into the chat box just on the side there, and we'll be picking them up and answering them as we go. Um, 
Oh, right. So one of the first questions that uh, came out of this was, you know, somebody asked, um, how do you communicate with customers before and after the launch? Yeah, that's kind of the golden question is how do you, how do you close that circle? Uh, you know, that's why I think that's where, that's where I come in from making sure that everything is documented. Every mention of something is there in a place. It's, in ProdPad, it's in Trello, it's in whatever tool that you use so that when you're saying that this thing is done, you have it written in a list somewhere and you say this thing is done, you make sure to look back to all of those things that you pasted and all the screenshots that you put in and you could follow up with all those people. So you're not only creating a, a, a treasure trove of data for your team to make decisions and craft a solution, but you're also giving yourself and your product marketing team, success team, whatever it might be, support team, you're giving them the tools that they need to then loop back with those people. Yeah, that's a really great point. I mean, that's one thing that I've found is, you know, just that ability to go back to a customer, even if it's six months later, saying, hey, mm -hmm. remember that thing you asked for? We actually built something out of it. Here's what we've created. Do you want to have a, you know, first stab at it? Um, always just makes such a big difference, and you always see so much appreciation coming from your customers when you do that. Yeah, so the, worst, the worst thing is when you've built something and then you don't close the loop and then a churn comes in and, and it's because they didn't know that you had uh, that thing and if you had only just kept a better log, I've, I've gone through this pain recently, uh, yeah. only if you kept a better log and closed that loop would you not have that churn. Yeah, I know that one. I know that one. Uh, and it's also really good to know that when somebody does churn, you know, you can see what it is they've asked for and as to whether you mm -hmm. did deliver on it and whether that was, you know, something that could have been avoided or not. Um, so I think that's really good. Uh, you know, it helps you just continuously learn as you go. Now, so who owns that piece? Who's, who's actually in charge of talking to the customers? Is that you as the product manager or is that more of the support team? How does that work with your team? Yeah, so we are, as I mentioned earlier, we are customer driven, customer first. So it's everyone's responsibility to talk to the customer. I I see my role as the customer's best friend. So internally when conversations come up, I'm not trying to advocate to help the engineer, you know, win on this decision or the designer get their way with this thing, but I'm I'm in the position to advocate to make sure that we're all considering what the customer is saying and what they need what they need, but everyone on our team does does you know support shifts? We have the live chat on our website, and every single person on our team has one multi-hour block where they are responsible for talking to customers. So uh, it's a it's a shared responsibility for sure. But at the end of the day, it's my job to make sure that everyone still is properly sharing that responsibility and viewing the perspective of that uh, the outcome of those conversations properly. That's great. Yeah, it is really important to make sure that everyone's talking to the customers, if only if it's just to see so they can understand the pain and understand what kind of problems the customers are having. Um, so, I mean, how do you uh, how do you go about um, talking to these customers? Do you have a particular set of questions that you ask to elicit feedback, or do you just open it up and say, hey, we're thinking of doing this, or we just launched this, what do you think? Go about doing that. Yeah, uh, it's definitely dependent on the situation. So if we are, if we're looking to craft a brand new product, uh, I would take uh, a group of customers that I know are willing to talk, or or ones who are, you know, reach or they fit in a certain persona, uh, and I grab them from the database because I know that they they would be the target, or they might not be the target, but I still want to learn from them. I reach out and say, hey, we're thinking about building something new. I won't tell them what we're building because that can stay in the way that the conversation goes because if they think it's going to be X, and then it, it just becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's easy for someone to say, yeah, that yeah. thing, that thing. Um, so I, I leave those conversations super broad, and the questions that I ask just lead to understanding the pain rather than proposing a solution and getting feedback on it. Uh, for, for once we're building it, it's, uh, hey, here's an Envision file. Can you click through and answer these three questions? Uh, sometimes uh, a piece of our product, uh, so it's live chat, and a piece of the product touches millions of people because everyone people put it on their website and then they have thousands uh, of people that talk through it and thousands and thousands. So there, there are some situations where I would go to something like Mechanical Turk and set a, a, like a, a, set, a setup of screenshots and say, after you would click these three things, what do you expect to happen? So we go on data for that. So it, it, I mean, it very much depends on the kind of thing you're looking for feedback are, on and what kind of uh, stage you're at in that development cycle. 
Yeah, okay, that makes sense. I mean, we do something similar here. We've actually set up a Slack group that's just for people who are ProdPad users. And so every once in a while, we'll toss in a, um, a, a link to our mockups and have people click through and give their feedback there. Uh, but we've also gotten in the habit of asking one question that I think elicits a lot of feedback from people, which is, what frustrates you most about our product? And you'll find that even the people who love your product will have something, some niggly little thing that they'll tell you about if you ask them in that kind of format. And it just helps you understand, you know, what is good, what isn't working, what else could you be doing um, to help people out? And as you said, capture all that and make sure that you can close the loop for them. Absolutely. Uh, so how do, you, <laughs> how do you go about uh, communicating to internal stakeholders? You know, it's one thing to get uh, a new design and some code out the door and to launch a product that way, but, you know, you can't really properly launch without having buy-in from the salespeople and the support people and the marketing folks and making sure everybody's on board and is ready to talk about it in the same way. How do you go about keeping internal stakeholders in the loop? Yeah. Uh... It's tricky. It's a little easier for the stage that Drift is in right now. We're only about 15 people, so it's pretty easy for me to just show up to people's desk or Slack them and, and talk through that. So I have a, I have a weekly 10-minute sync up with uh, sales and marketing where we, I just tell them what's going on on the side of product and what the plans are. Uh, we also do a, a, a show and tell on Friday where everyone at the team, we sit down for an hour and everyone shows like, oh, I worked on this, oh, I worked on that. So that way everyone is seeing the designs as the designer uh, is, is crafting them. Everyone's seeing the engineering work that's in progress. Everyone's seeing the stuff that I'm exploring as uh, you know, a new integration or a new part of the product. I'm, we're all sh constantly showing the feedback on it. So it, that lends itself to an open culture where someone could, you know, they see it, everyone sees it. If you have an objection, you probably want to just go talk it out and, and understand, you know, where things are coming from with that person. Uh, but I think those those sorts of things are really powerful. We're not, uh, our, my CEO, David Cancel, has talked before about uh, being against the big reveal. It's really easy to want to, you know, develop everything and have it in this nice little bundle and then reveal it to everyone else. But it's totally, as you said, it's important to get that buy-in and, and one of the ways to get that buy-in is to show the in incremental progress. So not only are you trying to be incremental in what you're developing on the product side towards the customers, but you also want to be incremental on what you're showing the company internally so that you, they are also a part of that, that conversation. That's a really good approach. I mean, thinking about them as uh, people that you're releasing a product to. I really like that approach. Uh, now, you also mentioned this idea of, um, you know, creating something incremental uh, and avoiding the big reveal. Uh, is that kind of how you guys work? Do you avoid big bang launches, or is there a time that that's appropriate to do? Yeah, we try to avoid them as much as possible. Uh, the only, I mean, I think the only the times where Big Bang launches could work is when you know it's a it's a big, well-established company, and there is a huge team that did tons of market research and has worked on this for for months. Even still, I would argue against it, but there there are points where I I can see that it could work for a larger, more established organization. Uh, mm -hmm. But I I would still be a proponent of uh, any size. Get it out there, uh, but it gets harder when marketing has their PR process and they don't want the world to know. And there, there are pieces there, um, but I, I think if you're at a company that's less than, say, 100 employees and that's totally arbitrary, uh, then it, then the big reveal is a scary thing because you're investing a significant portion of of your resources as a company into a thing. Without yeah, that, that makes sense. More feedback, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. We're at a similar stage where we avoid doing anything that looks like a big bang launch because you simply don't know what's going to happen once it's out there. Um, we find that if we launch it internally, so with the people who are actively using ProdPad that day, uh, they can then get a feel for it. We get some feedback. We understand what's working, what's not working, and we have actual data to play with. And then when it actually comes to getting it out there, making noise about it, uh, we're, we're just more prepared and mm -hmm. the launch goes that much more smoothly. Uh, now, I noticed in your... Um, uh, in your slide deck that you had a couple screenshots of your products in Product Hunt, I think that was. Is that right? Yep. Okay, so what, what stage do you put, do you drop things into Product Hunt or do you wait until somebody actually, uh, you know, serendipitously drops it in there? Uh, the reason I ask is that I know a lot of people are nervous about putting something in Product Hunt in case they get a big crunch. Do yeah. you sort of uh, have a checklist or readiness um, level before you, you put it out somewhere like that? Yeah, I think the the readiness level is uh, 
will it break? <laughs> as long <laughs> as it doesn't, as long as you know it won't break at, I mean, Product Hunt isn't going to send you millions of users, but it could send you tens of thousands. And, and as, yeah. as long as you're somewhat prepared for, or, or well prepared for that part without going crazy, right? You can't just, it's easy to get in the cycle world. It's where, well, we have to make sure that this part will scale and we have to make sure that this and that and this and this. You just got to get it out there. And if things break, like, that's kind of a good problem to have because it means there are that many people interested enough. Uh, it's also uh, painful. We, you know, we've launched big things and, and they have broken uh, and that hurts and that is difficult to deal with. So it's a, it's a hard balance. Um, yeah, well, our, the way that we look at it is, you know, on the marketing side, do we have at least a landing page, like a specific landing page ready for it? On the product side, have we given it to some people already? Uh, and then if so, and they are using it successfully and there is some good feedback on it, uh, and then we'll move towards product hunt. But we won't, we would never do that as like the, the first step in the whole equation. It's let's give it to a couple people see how they react, see that it's useful, see that it doesn't break for a small group, and then and then go from there. Because it, it really, it, it, gives a, it gives a good bump. It validates things that uh, make sense to consumers and, and validates things that don't. Yeah, yeah. Now you've mentioned uh, that you've got this checklist that you create. Uh, could you share a couple of the items that you might have recently added to the checklist or, uh, you know, what are the top tips that you put, you'd put on that list? The checklist for making sure uh, that Launch readiness, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's I, I don't have it up with me, but it's essentially uh, do we consider? So I, I think there's there's one big piece of it that a lot of the times uh, on the the side of design, you we we get in this habit of designing for the case where everything is there. Like it's mm. filled with content. There's tons of stuff there, and the case where there's zero things there. But sometimes we don't necessarily consider the the states where there's a little bit of data, or uh, you know, a decent like middle of the road data. And and it's more to think of all those. So it's it's have we considered you know what this looks like on the whole spectrum and not just zero and full. Um, uh, another is. Uh, I mean, I, I always come back to the to the dependency checklist is how many people internally are we waiting on to get this thing out the door? And is is the thing that they're doing right now more important than getting this other thing out the door? Uh, I, I think one of the things that I, I'm always saying is, you know, it's it's easy to get tied up in the next thing and then, you know, this team wants to keep moving forward, but if this team did this other thing two weeks ago and we're waiting on it for our customers to get value on it. We just got to stop the presses on the other stuff, get through to that, and then move back on. So uh, I, I got totally sidetracked there, but that's some of my <laughs> thoughts around that. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, dependencies are a real pain. Um, you know, I've, I've always seen that projects just end up getting bloated or wrapped up in themselves. Uh, do you have any tips for not getting tied in a knot because of dependencies? Yeah. I, so the way that I kind of go about it is I, I keep a lot of this stuff, A, in my mind, and B, on, on the tools that we use. So in Trello, I make sure that we label anything that relies on someone outside of the team. So each team, each product team has their own Trello board. And anytime there's something on that board that requires a dependency on, on someone else outside of that team, I put a label on it that says, there, you know, there is a dependency here. So I'm constantly monitoring those and then checking in with people saying, hey, have we made sure that we've talked about, uh, you know, with the other team about this thing? And it, it, it comes down to the whoever the engineer on that project is, that, that job that we're solving, they're responsible for looking at those dependencies and ultimately they kind of own it. But on a high level, at least seeing, you know, what are the pieces that are dependent uh, are, are, are a good first step because at least – it's it's important to have at least one person continually staying aware of that, and that's yeah. kind of me as a product product manager. Um, I want to make sure that I know what all the dependencies are so that we can get things out. Um, and it, this is one of those things that kind of crosses the line a little bit with project managey type things. Um, and that's why we're we're trying to move towards a culture where all the engineers and the the tech leads and they're the ones that own all those dependencies. Uh, but it's important that someone, especially in the early stages, someone is, uh, you know, like a hawk paying attention to everything that's dependent and just trying to talk things out to say, hey, how, how can we get this along quicker? Yeah, 
Okay, that's really great. Um, now you've also um, you mentioned that you've been using uh, data for this kind of stuff. Um, what data do you use, and you know how do you go about gathering that, and how do you use that to decide what you're going to work on next? Yes. Um, so it it kind of depends. So in in what situation is it when we're when we're looking at you know the big next release that data comes down to you know how many people have specifically voiced concerns about a problem related to this if it's something you know we're looking to improve a piece of the product it's how many people have said something about it i mean that's that that's one of the things that i as a product manager love about having live chat there is i get both quantitative and qualitative data. I have 15 people that are saying, how, like, hey, how can I edit this thing? And that's more than enough data to say, all right, this one's the most important based on sheer volume of people saying that they want this thing. Um, so it's it's taking the qualitative and boiling it down into, into quantitative data. And I, I, I think that'll certainly change as as we start to get bigger. Uh, when I was at HubSpot, I worked on the Sidekick team, which uh, it used to be a tool to tell you when people opened your emails, and it's now been rebranded. But we had so many people using it that it was really easy to just take a list of the user base, reach out, and say, uh, you know, hey, you know, how would you feel about this screenshot being added? And, and then we would just use that data as a means to inform the final decision. Right. Okay. That's good to know, and that's not dissimilar to how uh, we work right now in terms of, you know, taking a mixture of qualitative and quantitative, um, trying to figure out, you know, how many people have asked for this, or what were they asking for when they, what were they talking about when they asked for it, what was the context of the problem, as well as, you know, purely how many people have asked for this type of feature, and therefore should we consider this one over the next one? Yeah, yeah. We also use. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of Heap Analytics, which gives us access to, yeah, you, you basically turn it on once in your product and then it gives you historical data. Like you don't have to define events, you don't have to define they clicked on this, but you can go back and look at it historically, which is amazing because we're thinking about revisiting one full part of the, of the application. So I could just go in and say, over the past six months, how have people clicked on that? Like what has bit drawn the most attention? So that's, that's another really, really powerful way of, of getting data. And then I'm, I'm a huge fan of a tool called Full Story, which is kind of like DVR for your users. So you can go in, you could like block uh, important information so that uh, you know that stuff doesn't get recorded. But you go in and watch people use it. And and I sit down with one of our uh, with our lead designer every week, and we go through those sessions and just watch. And we say, wow, we just watched five sessions, and three people ran into this UX issue. We should probably just go fix that. Okay, that's great. I'm really glad you mentioned both Heap Analytics and Full Story. We've been looking at both of those as possibilities to add to our own stack. Yeah. Um, so it's good to hear what's working. I think it's a space that's really heating up right now, the whole product analytics type of space, and there's a lot of new players in there. So definitely one to watch, but uh, I'm definitely going to be checking out those two, Heap and Full Story. Um, now, one uh, one uh, person has asked this question. They said that their customer, uh, their company, has recently implemented a tool for their customers to submit ideas directly. Um, have you done this before or seen this work? Yeah, at Sidekick, we had we used User Voice, and User Voice gives you a tool to have a community forum. So it was anyone can just go on. It was attached to the support stuff, and anyone can go on and add an idea or upvote other ideas. And that was great. Um, we, it was great because it gave me a pulse of what was going on. I never used it as a means to make the decision of what we're doing next because, I mean, sometimes the the, the reality is that the customers don't necessarily know the, the the next thing that they want, and and there would be things that would have the most votes, but they were just so tech technologically or technically challenging that they just weren't going to give us the highest leverage thing. So it was good to see that a good amount of the stuff that we were doing had a decent amount of votes and a good amount of suggestions. It was good, uh, but I wouldn't say that it helped. It helped. It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't something that we leaned on to make decisions. It was a good thing for a, a pulse. 
Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. I've always seen it the same way in that it's one type of input, uh, but yeah. you can't just build, you know, you can't just build all the features that people ask for, um, and right. you can't just go by how many people vote something up, because sometimes the ideas that get voted up are, they seem really cool, but when you when it comes down to it, it's not going to add value to your business, or it's going to be so technically difficult to pull off that it's just not worth it. Um, but it is, it's, it's one of many different inputs that I think a product manager has to consider when they're prioritizing. Absolutely. It's a, it's a good way to get a surface, a surface thought, a bunch of surface thoughts from, from customers. Uh, we're, we're very drift, I mean, it's natural as we're very conversation driven. And I, my personal philosophy is that, uh, you know, a customer can say they want X, but they might not necessarily want X and you just have to keep digging to understand why they want that because that's where you get the really, really powerful stuff. And the suggestion box is great because it gives you that first thought, like the triggering thought to that deeper thing, but it does put a little bit of a, of a barrier up to get deeper into that conversation and really, really understand those things. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, now we've got a uh, somewhat tricky question here. Um, do you know anything, or can you weigh in on how to build for a two-sided marketplace? So, you know, one of your first questions was, does it solve a problem in the current state? But with a marketplace app, that can be very, very difficult because, you know, you might need buyers and sellers or employers and job seekers or whatever the two sides are. What's your advice for somebody looking to launch a product in that space? Yeah, that's tricky. Uh, that was my first role as a product manager was with a two-sided marketplace, so I have some experience with it. Uh, so the way that I could just talk talk from experience, the way that we did it was we built it for one side of the market. We took hits on cost and and uh, and the things associated with that, but we found a way to get those people engaged. So we were solving something for them. Uh, that that was like the core piece of it was you know there there's sides A and B and we identified was that side A which was the consumer side we needed volume on the consumer side to make B work so we were okay saying let's not worry about B we can like hack ways to make B work and let's instead focus on giving some value to A to drive up use there and then start building on B so it's I mean, it's a really, really tricky, tricky balance, and different kinds of marketplaces have different abilities to do that or not to be able to do that. Uh, like Airbnb, you can't necessarily fake uh, <laughs> fake uh, renters. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I can't speak too much from experience uh, on that. Most of it would just be speculation if I, if I answer it outside of that. That's fair. Well, I've got um, one story I can share. It wasn't a product that I worked on, but it was a great case study I heard. Um, are you familiar with the company Halo? It was a, it's a taxi hailing um, yes, app. Yes. Yep. May, it's for the London market more than anywhere else, um, so it's one that I know quite well in, in our area. But what they actually did, they actually spent a year or more, or something like that, building up the side of the app that was just for the drivers themselves. So the black cab drivers had this app that didn't actually help them pick up customers at all. It helped them figure out where there might be, you know, um, a concert letting out, so there might be a lot of people there, or where there might be traffic that they might want to avoid, or other things like that to get a feel for, you know, it, it was a communication app that they could use and almost a social network for taxi app, um, taxi drivers. Uh, and once they actually, as soon as they released the customer facing side of it, which was you can now use your phone to call a, a black cab taxi, which is brand new at the time, uh, when they when customers pulled that up, there actually were ca cabs there. And they did that by making sure that the cabs already had this tool that they were using anyways. They found it valuable. Um, and then when they added on the consumer side, it made it super valuable because all of a sudden they were also getting money out of this thing. Um, so I think that was uh, that kind of reflects the same thing you were saying, which is solve for one side of it, provide value to them, and then um, you know open up the floodgates and let the other side in once you actually can prove that you can solve a problem and you've got the, the you know, minimum number of users or people there, or transactions happening. Yeah, that's a great case study. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my favorites, and I, I always go back to that when I'm thinking about market, marketplaces, but they're not easy. Um, yeah. Another space that's not easy, and somebody's got a question about this, is the enterprise uh, space. Um, you know, how do you deal with it when customers need advance notice or have really specific needs and they're in the enterprise space and they've paid you, you know, not 
uh, thousands per month, but probably tens or hundreds of thousands per month for your product. Any advice for uh, somebody dealing with that kind of issue? Yeah, uh, that's challenging <laughs> because you could have yeah five people, five big enterprise customers all requesting slightly different things and then you wind up in a place where you only you purely have the resources to handle three of them. Um, yeah. yeah, I I am one to lean towards transparency in those sorts of situations. Like you just have to uh, and this is where I feel like some people get tripped up is it's really easy to just promise that yes we'll have this, yes we'll have this because you want to keep that customer and that's fair uh, but you have to be incredibly realistic about the timeline that uh, that's associated with these things because I, and I mean I, I get trapped in this all the time. Hey, when are you going to have this thing? Oh, we'll have it in three weeks. Four and a <laughs> half weeks later, hey, are you going to have that thing yet? Uh, but I mean other priorities come into play and and, and things get pushed off because of scope creep and because of dependencies and all these other things. So I would err towards the, the realm of you know, deciding which one is going to give, if, if there are five options, choose, say you can only do three of them, uh, pick the three that are going to give you the most long-term leverage for other clients and then you tell, you, you transparent saying, hey, uh, you know, we are going to have it as soon as possible, however, you know, we are in this position. Here's how much how much we have in terms of resources. This is what we're working for, um, and just just be brutally honest about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's really good advice, um, and I know it is a tricky space. Uh, now, somebody else had a question in here, and it's going back to the tactical, which is, um, are you saying that you use Mechanical Turk as your test subjects? You mentioned uh, using Mechanical Turk as a way to get people to give feedback on your uh, your designs and your, your workflows. Yeah, uh, only in specific situations. So because, so we're, we're live chat and I would never use Mechanical Turk to test the UI for a company or business to talk to uh, visitors, but on the visitor side that thing is something that you know millions and millions of people will see. Uh, if we do our job great it'll be billions and uh, that is the kind of thing where you know I don't want to bug 50 of our customers to tell me if like when they click this button they think that the sidebar is going to close uh, that's just not it's not worth their time it's not worth my time and ultimately like the people who are on mechanical Turk are, are you know sometimes your everyday people that are interacting with that sort of thing anyway so I think if if you have a, like something that's very consumer facing uh, consumer app or, or that sort of thing it's okay to use that uh, but if you know, if you're selling B2B SaaS software, I would never turn to Mechanical Turk to say, what do you think of the way of this CRM is? Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a good rule of thumb. Uh, yeah. And I think you're right, there's going to be different uh, different tools that are appropriate for different levels of feedback that you need. Uh, one of my favorite tools has always been one called Five Second Test. Um, and it's basically, you, you take a screenshot of something and it pops up on the screen for five seconds and then you ask questions about what they saw on the screen. They've got another one alongside it which is called, I think it's called the click test, um, and you put up a screenshot and say where would you click and people can point out where they would click on the screen. Just really, really simple stuff but it's the type of thing that you can have done and have a, a, a at least a vague answer to, you know, what, how are people going to react to this screen? And it doesn't take up time of your customers. It takes up, you know, five minutes of your time to create the screenshot and upload it and have the answer in ten minutes after that. Um, so I like things that, that allow you to get that first round of feedback as well. Yeah, that's great. I'll still look into this. All right. So I think that's um, all the time we have for questions today. Um, if you guys do have other questions, then by all means keep uh, sending them through on the um, ProdPed Talk, uh, ProdPed Talks um, uh, hashtag, or uh, send us an email, and we'll be happy to um, try to answer the questions the best we can. Um, so. Uh, this pretty much wraps everything up. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for your time. This has been really great and really enlightening to, to hear from you. Uh, Thanks we for are going me. Yeah, of course, of course, anytime. Uh, we are we have recorded this session, so we are going to send this out to you guys. Uh, so you'll be able to have this recording, replay it, share it with your team, whatever you need. Uh, and by all means, uh, both Drift and Prodpad have uh, free trials, so try them out and uh, you know send us your feedback. Um, you know we're we're always listening and learning. 
Um, so thanks again for everything. Um, do tweet us if you have more questions, get in touch. Uh, but uh, uh, thanks for everything. Um, good having you again, Matt, and talk to you guys later. Take care, Janet. Thanks for hosting. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye.